Okay, I think we're still just a, a little bit shy of what we were shooting for for the group photo. So we'll go ahead and get the session started. Susan, if you wouldn't mind starting your screen share for us. Okay, you're not seeing that you're not seeing my screen. We don't see anything right now. Okay, let me just um... Ah. So while Susan is getting that set up, I'll say a few words about this session. Um, so today we have the pleasure of welcoming Susan Carey and Jean-Rémy Oakman. Um, both Susan and Jean-Rémy are experts in cognitive development, um, and they'll be talking about early understanding of concepts that serve as the basis for logical and analogical reasoning. So I'm talking about things like modality, negation, and sameness. Um, and in particular, we'll hear about whether there's evidence for these kinds of concepts in preverbal infants, I can't or whether they only emerge later with language acquisition. Ah, uh, good. All right, let me get a share screen. Can you ask if your screen is shared? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Okay, are you seeing my slide? Yeah, we don't see the title slide, but we see everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Okay. okay, so now we have Susan Carey, who runs the Carey Lab at Harvard University. Thank you. First, I want to thank the organizers. And as far as I'm concerned, Rachel is the organizer because she's the only person I've uh, spoken to about this. But I want to thank you very much for inviting me. I've really, really enjoyed this conference. I didn't know about DuCog before, before this. Um, so the big question that um, I want to explore here is the question of whether non-linguistic creatures have a Fodorian language of thought. By non-linguistic creatures are creatures who do not yet know a human natural language, non-human animals who can't learn one, and human infants who haven't learned one yet. So what's a Fodorian language of thought? Well. Uh, it's a theoretical issue, um, but um, it's a representational computational system that has the properties of involving symbols that are not iconic, um, that combine productively with each other to represent propositions which bear truth value and support deductive inference. So minimally, that's what I mean by a Fedorian language of thought. With respect to the question of whether non-linguistic creatures have such a representational system, um, philosophers have debated this issue uh, from the armchair on a priori grounds. Uh, Fodor argued, obviously, yes. Um, and with respect to the non-linguistic creatures, human infants, um, the argument was a one-liner. Um, Language has these properties. Infants can learn language, therefore they must have a, a non-linguistic language of thought. Um, I completely agree that there must be innate support for uh, a representational computational system with the properties of a language of thought because infants learn language and language has those properties. Um, um, but that, uh, well, other philosophers, Donald Davidson on the left, Descartes on the other, argued obviously no. The point is it's not obvious one way or the other. Um, it's both a theoretical question. The question is, are there structured mental representations that don't have those properties? Is there a joint in, in nature between perception uh, on the one hand, for example, and um, reasoning or uh, language on the other. Um, and if so, how do we characterize that difference? That's, those are theoretical and empirical issues. And if there's a joint in nature between the uh, perceptual systems, navigation systems, structure, clearly structured representations, what the nature of that structure is in language, um, 
how do we know for non-linguistic creatures whether they also have um, a Fedorian language of thought? Those are very hard, both theoretical and empirical issues. Um, and there's two ways of thinking about innate support for logically structured thought that are that's consistent with uh, nonverbal creatures lacking a Fodorian language of thought. One is that this form of reasoning arises in hominid evolution with language and, on, and in ontogenesis upon learning language. So yes, there's innate support, but it's part of the language acquisition mechanism. Um, and uh, it, uh, another possibility is, yes, this kind of thought is present in non-linguistic creatures, including human infants, but it's implicit in the sense that the logical content is carried by the computations that explicit symbols enter into. That is, it, it isn't a symbolic representation the way language is. Okay. So how do we study this? How do we study this, this set of empirical and theoretical questions? They have to do it case study by case study because uh, non-linguistic non thought could have some of the properties of a Fatorian language of thought, but not, not all, right? Um, and going back to pre-MAC, um, this question has been studied and pre-MAC started both the line of research that John Remy is going to talk about, about abstract representation, abstract relations, and the study of logical connectives and specifically the disjunctive syllogism as an empirical wedge into this question. So why, why is the disjunctive syllogism relevant? Um, well, it's, it's a deductive inference. Um, or and not are propositional connectives. So if you have representations of or and not, um, um, then uh, in the relevant sense, um, uh, they, they are part of uh, a system of propositional representations. They're abstract, they're not iconic. Um, it doesn't matter what the content of the proposition are. I mean, it's obvious that um, logical connectives are part of logically structured thought, sort of by definition. Okay. So how do you do this? Well, um, you, you have no option. You have to, to choose tasks which on their face seem to re require uh, a deduct, uh, uh, the deductive working through the disjunctive syllogism. Then you rule out deflationary alternatives, both for successes and failures, right? So if there's a success, it might be, there might be something leaner underlying, underlying it. And if there's failure, it may be for performance limitations irrelevant to the competence that you are looking for. And then you also must test models of the actual symbols and computations underlying this success, exploring distinctive signatures of different formats and conceptual roles for those symbols. So I'm going to illustrate um, very early progress, um, starting with Premax um, case study, um, which has been followed up, as I'm going to show you, in lots of research. Um, okay. So here's a, here is a face valid task that's taken in the literature to reflect the disjunctive syllogism, namely referent disambiguation. So I've shown you these two things and I ask you, where is the, where's the DAX? Which is the DAX? Point to the DAX. Um, and um, uh, babies robustly starting about 17 months of age, um, look at the whatever that thing is, um, not the cup, okay? And this on its face seems to be working through a disjunctive syllogism. Dax could either mean the cup or that other thing. It can't be the cup because the cup is named cup. I mean, it's either, a, you, the exclusion inference is either uh, driven by a word learning constraint or a pragmatic constraint. If he'd meant cup, he would have said cup. Um, therefore, it must be that other thing. 
So Justin Alberta did the first infant study in 2003. And <laughs> when he asked the child to look at the cup, children from um, 14 months to 18 months <coughs> looked at the cup. Uh, this is uh, plotting the, per the percent of increase of looking at the named object relative to the baseline preference between the cup and the other object. So they change their uh, gaze towards the cup with no change versus stage. But where's the DAX? Children under 16 or 17 month olds failed to look at the novel object, but starting at 17 months, uh, 16 and a half to 17 months, um, they switched their gaze, gaze and looked at the DAX, um, um, looked at the novel object more than their baseline preference. Um, this is a very, very robust behavior um, at 17 months and older, been replicated many times. Halberta found, did not find it less than uh, 17 months and neither did it a, a big study by Frank and a colleague, Michael Frank and a colleague. But there are now um, three reports of success much younger, uh, 12 and 14 months, um, um, showing that the robust success at reference this disambiguation and this kind of paradigm. So the question is, is there a leaner interpretation of success? Um, and so the disjunctive um, syllogism interpretation is that the reasoning um, has a logical form. DAX refers to object one or two, object two is called cup, therefore DAX does not refer to object two, therefore DAX refers to object one. Um, but there is an alternative, a specific word learning constraint. Um, perhaps there's just, there's just a preference to map novel words to novel objects. So if that's what's underlying uh, success here, there's no premise A or B and there's no exclusion inference not B. Um, um, another leaner one is that you constrain the choice to the objects in view. At attention all is highly limited, it's constrained. Um, and, but you do rule out object two is above. Um, so it's not object two. So here there's the exclusion inference, but there's no representation of or um, and no deductive inference. Okay. So the very fact that you can think of deflationary alternatives doesn't make them true. You have to test between them. And people, the reason I'm going through this example is people have tried to, and they tried to in two ways. So Justin Alberta looked for evidence of the online inference itself. So what he did, this is, since this was a, a eye tracking study, um, is that when you hear the word DAX, half of the time, roughly, um, children's or adults um, are looking at the novel object when you hear the word. Um, and half the time they're looking at the cup when they hear the novel word, okay? And that what he looked at is what was the pattern of looking as a function of that. Um, and um, importantly, um, if you're just asked to name the cup, you just stay on the cup. You don't go back and forth. And also importantly, both subjects have had plenty of time to encode both objects. So it's not necessary to draw the inference um, that you move over to the cup and check it and move back. But that's what both adults and, and three-year-olds do. So if they're looking at the DAX, when you hear, look at the DAX, they look over at the cup and then they look back to the DAX and stay there. And if, they, if, if there's a pointing response, they point only then after they've looked back, okay? And so what he's saying is that this is a non-necessary um, 
pattern of looking that reflects actually working through the disjunctive syllogism, okay? And ro robustly adults and three-year-olds do that. And the 17-month-olds do not. If they're looking at the cup when they hear dax, they just go over here. If they're looking at this when they hear dax, they just stay here. Okay, so they fail to show that signature of working through the, the online processing with the structure of the deductive inference. The other way that people have tried to address this question is to try to get evidence about deductive certainty. Um, now this is really in, indirect, but the question is, the fact that they're looking at the DAX doesn't mean that they've actually inferred that that's what the word means. So do they learn the word? So in some studies by Anne An Fernald's group, they um, compared uh, the likelihood of learning the word um, in conditions where both of these are here, but you point it at, at the this and say, look at the DAX, right? compared to uh, where you have to get to that by the, by the inference. So this, the, the, the pointing one is a control for learning several novel words, right? Um, and where you don't have to arrive at the, the right reference through mutual exclusivity. And the, the children learn several words um, in the pointing condition, but they don't learn the words that they got to by hypothesis through mutual exclusivity um, until between ages um, two and a half and three. Okay, so the conclusions from this is that people have tried to find evidence that distinguish between one and two, and it's easy to find at age three, by age three to adulthood, but it's not present um, in the infant studies. Now this is, you know, it, much more I'm not saying this is conclusive. I'm just saying this is what you want, you need to do, right? You, you need to formulate the alternatives and try to test them. Okay, second face valid task. This is one of my favorite experiments in the world, um, object identity disambiguation or object uh, location disambiguation depends upon what the premises are supposed to be. Um, so this is the, Sasana Arlotti et al. science paper. I probably you all know this, um, um, but it's a looking time study. The child sees two objects that um, look identical from the top. Um, they they it's they're covered. A cup scoops in and comes out and bring brings an object that has, is consistent with either of these objects because both of their tops are identical, okay? So at this point, the child is supposed to set up uh, a representation of two possibilities. It's the snake in the cup or the ball in the cup, or perhaps the possibilities is, uh, uh, the snake is in the cup and the ball behind the screen, or the snake is behind the screen and the ball is in the cup, exactly what the premises are. There's lots of ways you could set up the, this junction. Um, then um, the child gets the information that allows them to disambiguate the identity here. Um, the one behind the screen uh, is the snake. So the one in, it can't, the one in the cup can't be the snake therefore the one in the cup is the ball. Okay, that's the object disambiguity disjunctive syllogism. Um, and, and indeed in the end, um, if you, this is standard uh, violation of expectancy, you then show them either a consistent outcome or an inconsistent outcome. So an in, a consistent outcome is the snake come out, comes out again. An impossible outcome is that the ball comes out again because there were only two objects in the screen in, in the scene. And so this is requires that there be two behind the screen, but there's also one here. Okay, and babies, even 12, 12 month olds and 19 month olds look longer at the inconsistent outcome. Um, 
what's so beautiful about this experiment is that this is very weak evidence for working through a disjunctive syllogism. The child just needs to start with an initial model of this and wait till he gets here. Um, and what, what you're seeing is inconsistent with this model and you don't have to have inferred anything in the middle, right? So what they did was, was capture looking time measures during this, what they call the potential deduction phase and compared it to a condition where there was no inference at all. The child knew, so it's the same structure. This is here, is scoop, but the C, which one is scooped out here before the screen is here. So at this point, the child has a full mental model of a snake here and a cup here throughout the whole scene. And what they found was evidence of uh, greater information processing pupil dilation in this phase in the inference condition than the non-inference condition. And also they found evidence of looking towards the cup when, this, when the snake appears in the inference condition, but the, not the no inference. So they, they like what, what Alberta was trying to get at, what were looking for online evidence of the inference and they found it um, both at 12 and 17 months. This is a beautiful experiment. However, I still think there's two interpretations of success here. Um, and, uh, one is the disjunctive syllogism. One I'm assuming object identity disambiguation. So the object is in the cup. The object in the cup is the ball, or the object in the cup is the snake. That's the disjunction. The snake is behind the screen. Therefore, the object in the cup is not the snake. Therefore, it's the ball. Um, but there is an alternative um, um, that makes use of object file representations. I, I, you can call it perceptual specification and it also involves a one-to-one -one mapping inference. So here's, here is the, um, this alternative interpretation. I, I, I forgive all the words, but it's important that you understand the structure of it. So, you establish a mental model of the two objects, a cup and a snake in the event. That's what you do in the initial thing. You make a mental model. Um, you hold this in visual working memory. When the, when the screen comes up, you hold, you, you hold this in visual memory and you just watch as the event proceeds. You're just perceiving the event. You monitor the unfolding scene relative to the model um, because you know what's in the scene, the cup and the ball. Um, it, and it's represented visually in visual working memory. After the scoop, cup scoops out the object, there is as yet no evidence to update the current model, what you're looking at um, with respect to the mental model. So you don't, except that the two objects are now in the cup and behind the screen rather than both behind the screen. Okay, so you're just looking at what's happening and um, um, but after the snake comes out, um, you can um, now specify the model. This is what I mean by perceptual specification. Specify the, the model of what you're seeing relative to this mental model. Um, the, the, the object behind the screen is the snake in the working memory model. And the only remaining object in the memory model is the ball. Um, and it's a one-to-one -one mapping process. So, so here, there's no symbols for or or not. There's no, there's no exclusion inference and there's no deductive inference over logically structured thoughts. Although there is an inference, it's a perceptual inference. I mean, there's tremendous inference in perception, right? Okay, so this is, this is it's, what we need is a window into what the actual symbols are that are underlying the inference that Sasani Alavi showed that were, was made. Um, and we, we want um, evidence for deductive certainty. I don't know how to get it in this paradigm, um, but there is another paradigm, the one most studied in this, um, in this literature um, um, that 
in which there has there have been three major efforts to search for signatures of de deductive certainty. And so this is what um, uh, um, I'm going to spend the rest of the talk on. This is the call top cup task. Um, it, this was the task introduced by Premack in the 80s in a different version. Um, and um, here's the structure of the task. I'm going to show you it with infants because this is the version. This is a version that uh, I'm going to actually test with infants at the end of the talk. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, come on, let's hold on. I know this is less exciting. Oh, are you ready? Okay, look at this. And look at this. Okay, that's. Okay, that's the structure of the task. So an object is hidden into in one of two containers where you don't know which container it went in. Um, and then um, you show the child that one of the containers is empty or the animal. And the question is, do they search, go directly to the other container? Okay. Um, this task is solved spontaneously by non-human primates um, and by many, many, many other animal species, sometimes with a little bit of training or a lot of training, but solved. Um, um, it solved the, the published developmental work um, shows that it's solved by 20-month-olds, um, 23-month-olds, and three-year-old children. Um, um, and it transparently is a face valid task for the disjunctive syllogism. If you think the child is reasoning, well, the ball is either in the left bucket or the right bucket. I forget what, which one was empty. Um, it's not in the one that was shown to be empty. Um, so it must be in the other. Okay, so that's the, that's the disjunctive syllogism version of that. But there are two alternative interpretations. Okay, so one is, there is a constrained search. You're only considering the bu buckets, but you only have a representation of the goal, okay? You're looking for the ball. So you represent the goal. You could search at random um, uh, in that constrained search space. Um, and you keep searching until the threshold for a match is achieved. Okay, this on this whole hypothesis, this does not preclude searching in the same location over and over again, right? So you're there's no option elimination and there's no or um, uh, represented there. There's just a search, a search space and a random search procedure um, seeking the goal, right? There's a second one in which there is option elimination, but no or. Um, so again, constrained search with the representation of goal. And um, when, you, when an option is shown to be empty, representation or not, um, but no deductive, uh, but th then, you, then you eliminate that option. And if there's only two goals, two, two, two options in this constrained search, um, you, look, you look there. So there would be no disjunctive certain, certainty here because there was no premise involving or, but you would at least succeed, okay? So A is not consistent with success, but B is, right? Um, if they consistently um, eliminate the option, there's at least not, I would think. Okay, so, but the question there is the difference between A and B is deductive certainty that reflects um, that the premises are joined by an or, right? Um, so several people have looked for deductive certainty in this location disambiguation task. So Watson et al, including our, our Yuri, our friend Yuri, um, did a, a, an absolutely gorgeous experiment um, in which they had three, it, it, this is, they used the structure of a Piagetian invisible displacement task. So there were, 
there were three places um, and a, a person went behind the three big screens with a highly desirable object and came out at the end without it. Um, so at that point you can set up the premise. It's either in under screen A, B or C. Then they let dogs and five-year-old children search for that highly desirable object. Um, and um, they, the, of course the child, if just searching at random, you might the first time get it right. Um, um, so they looked at, at cases where the first case was wrong, the second case was first and second case wrong, were wrong, searches were wrong, looking for uh, whether they sped up after they've eliminated both options and went to the third as if they were sure now where it was. And five-year-olds showed this pattern, but dogs did not. Dogs just extinguished if they, if they uh, had searched in the first two, you know, they just got slower instead of getting faster. Okay, so here they're looking for a reaction time signature of dejective certainty. Colin Carpenter's task had the same structure. There were three places that you could search, um, but they were looking at what, but you could check before you looked and so they were looking at whether you sought more information. And they showed that if you, you didn't seek more information, if you actually had, had seen before where it is, if you knew from seeing where it was. But again, they had hundreds of trials of these three search things. And they could look at, if you have looked in two places and it's not there, do you just then reach for it in the third place without searching? You make the deductive inference. And neither chim chimpanzees or two and a half year old children did. Um, and I'm now gonna go through um, uh, Shil Modi's and my attempts um, to look for ded deductive certainty in this object location sense. But the key thing here is dogs know, two and a half year old children know um, by this, these measures looking for deductive certainty. Okay. So the way we did it, um, we're looking for evidence of the or it, uh, in the relation between these two. So instead of just having two cups, we had four cups. So, well, first there's a practice trial where one sticker is hid, hidden behind um, these two cups and then a second sticker is hidden behind this cup. Um, um, and we then ask, uh, we model for them. It's a, it's a competitive game. You get one chance. Um, the Confederate models for the children. When you get a choice, he says, hmm, well, I don't know where it is in this one. It could be in this one or this one but I'm sure it's in this one, so I'm going to pick this one. So we lay out the argument for them and model it with the, the Confederate um, explaining the basis of his choice, okay? And then here is the test trials, testing um, the disjunctive syllogism. So there's two acts of hiding, one sticker behind this set of cups, and one sticker behind this side of cups. And then the Confederate goes first on most of the trials, but sometimes we let the child, we don't analyze those data because they has no way which, of knowing. So the Confederate always picks an empty cup. And so now the child, if the child can work through a disjunctive syllogism has the same structure as the three cup task. If you've if you've gotten to deductive certainty here, you have a choice between a 100% option and two 50% options. Uh, so this is a way of trying to see whether um, this two cup task leads to deductive certainty. Okay. So we took this, well, first of all, what happened on the practice trials? I mean, the, the, Confederate modeled what you're supposed to do, but did children actually do that? And, 
and chance is choosing among the three cases. And so, yes, at all th ages, we did two and a half year olds through five year olds, they were better than chance. And we took that as evidence that they understood this task and that they, they understood the distinction between, they could compute the distinction between 100% possibility, uh, po uh, probability and 50-50 probability. Um, but actually, I don't believe that anymore. And this is lousy performance. Um, the two and a half and three-year-olds are choosing the certain option only, you know, let, you know, at a level not different from 50%, all right? So they're not showing um, uh, uh, the distinction between 100% probability and 50-50 probability. And the four and five-year-olds are more than 50, they are significantly greater than, than 50% and significantly better than these two, um, but their performance isn't, isn't, uh, that strong. Then what about the test trials, the four cups trials? Um, well, the data we, we took as evidence that two and a half year olds were not working through the disjunctive syllogism is they eliminated the option, but they chose between the remaining three, 33%, 33%, 33%, right? So there's no evidence that they updated the probability uh, uh, in the other cup to a, to 100%. Um, um, whereas the older children performed exactly the same way they did on the test trials. Okay, so these three graphs do not differ from these three graphs. So, so what we what we interpreted at that point was that this is a failure of the two and a half year olds, consistent with Colin Carpenter, to show the evidence of deductive certainty. Um, but, but this was evidence that at least some children were at least sometimes doing that. I no longer think that, okay? Um, so two things, this pattern of results and the, the aspect of the pattern of results that I want you to focus on is the 50-50 performance um, on both the three cups task and the four cups task. It's now been replicated seven or eight times at age three or two and a half. Um, so here's where our data, where, where on the three cups, they weren't different from 50% and the four, the, on four cups, they weren't different from 33%. That actually doesn't replicate. So here's a direct replication of the task um, and the, the, two and a half year olds are the same on the four cups as the three cups task. Um, but it's, they're only choosing the certain cup 50% of the time. And the, uh, not different. The, the, the three year olds are consistently around 60, but not statistically different from 50 and not statistically different from the two and a half year olds. Okay. So, What do we want? What's the significance of this 50% um, performance? Okay. You have about 10 more minutes, Susan. Oh, no. Okay. We can go over a little bit in a few minutes. I, I, I will, I will, I know what I will take leave out. Um, and um, yeah, okay. Okay, what's the significance of this 50-50 performance? Well, it is a failure to represent or, right? If you, if you represent that, that, that the doubleton, the, 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 the sticker could be in the left one or the right one, then you should, you should realize there's only a 50-50 um, probability that the sticker is in either one of those compared to uh, in the certain cup. Um, but this task also um, makes great working memory de demands, right? You, ha you, know, you have to rule out deflationary alternatives to failures, right? So the, the child could be 
just failing to remember. There's two acts of hiding. You have to remember, you know, you then in the four cup case have to update um, um, when you see one that's empty. But great working memory demands. And so maybe the failure just reflects the working memory demands of this task. So we did a task that got rid of working memory, right? So this is a task where you hold a marble here and you drop it in, or you hold it and you hold one here and you drop it in. And you have one cup and you have one chance to catch a marble. And if you catch the marble, you get to put it in this thing here, which is a jingle box, which has a xylophone in it and it goes ding, 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 ding as it goes down and the kids love it and they're highly motivated to get the marbles. So you've got two marbles here, you're gonna drop them at once. And the question is, where do you put the cup in order to catch the marble? Okay, this has the same structure as the call cup task. There is no working memory demands here. Everything is visible, you've got the two You've got the two marbles here when you make the choice of where to put the cup. And so there is a, there's a version of the two cup task where you've taught them that you can put a blocker in here um, and they know, and you show them that when the blocker is in, it won't go down this side. So you put the blocker next to where the slide will be and you ask them where you want to put the cup in the correct, I'm showing the correct location of the cup here is to put it that side. So here's the analog of the two cup task. You get exactly the same data as you get um, on, the, on the two cup task here. Here's the analog of the three cup task that I just took you through. And here's the analog of the four cup task, two marbles here where do you, and with the correct placement. Okay, so the question here is that if the failure on the three cups, the cups task is due to working memory demands, you should get better performance on the slides task. What do you get? Here are um, the two and a half year olds, three year olds and four year olds. And this is the left as the cups task, the right is the slides task. You couldn't have more identical distributions here, right? 50-50 choice of the certain, the certain option. Um, the only case they're different, they're worse on the slides task. And that was an artifact of the training um, that we did. Um, we replicated this, um, getting rid of that. And again, so got exactly the same distributions. So there's absolutely no evidence here that the problems in the three cups task are due to the working memory demands of the task. Now they might be due to some other demands of the task, but you have to come up with what they might be and test them. Okay, so what's the significance of this 50-50 uh, performance? Well, we think that it favors option B here. There is a constrained search here. They're only putting the cups or look at, looking in the cups or putting the cup under the, the exits with the representation of the goal. And there is an elimination of the option of the, of the one shown to be empty or the one shown about to be blocked. Um, but there's a failure to march, mark each of the exits on the fork slide as a possible place for a given marble to exit or to mark each of the cups on the two cup side as a possible location for the cups. The problem is the absence of a modal concept of possibility. That's the hypothesis, okay? So you might ask what? Of course, children have to have concepts of possibility. They make predictions. Prediction is by definition, a representation of a possibility. If you make a prediction, you've got a representation. It hasn't happened yet. It's, it's only possible. Yes, they make predictions, but they may not mark it as possible. They might not have a modal operator possible. Uh, they also constrain choices. Yes, but they may not mark each choice as merely possible. That's what you need to get the 50-50 probabilities, okay? So, so we take the constrained choice or the simulation and uh, one simulation um, um, and representing an, 
an outcome as minimal representations of possibility. Yes, they generate representations and we as theorists can see them as possibilities, but they, they needn't have a symbolic way of marking um, those representations as merely possible. Um, so, so think about how the minimal representation of possibility would lead to the 50-50 performance. Um, well, you represent a sticker in this one. You can simulate a sticker went into this one. On this side, you also do one simulation. Um, you simulate a sticker went into this one and represent that um, as, the, as the location of the sticker. So now when you're making a choice of which cup to pick, you have a representation of a sticker in this one and a representation of a sticker of, in one of these two. And that's why you choose 50-50. Similarly on the forked cup slide, okay? Um, the problem with that is, so this, so the 50-50 performance, which is the dominant much replicated result across all these experiments at two and a half and three is predicted by this minimal representation of possibility. Um, it's, it's a representation of possibility in the sense it's a prediction, but it's minimal because it doesn't allow you to represent two options of a single reality as both possible at the same time. And that's what modal concepts do for you, okay? It predicts 50-50, but a million things can predict 50-50, right? Um, you can get 50-50 um, if you're just choosing a sticker in advance um, and only paying attention to that. And so you, you, you choose on the side that sticker went, or you're just choosing sides at chance, right? You, there's lots of ways you can get 50-50. So to distinguish between whether, whether that this minimal representation of possibility is the conceptual problem here. Um, you want a task where that predicts something other than 50-50 performance. And so here is a paper. Uh, that from now on, these are hot off the press, just, just collected data and um, um, not even fully digested. But this, the idea here is for, well, first we had we brought the Modi and Kerry task online, so it's a pirate chest case because of COVID, but it's the same structure. A coin is hidden in the single case, the coin is hidden in the double thing case. You have one chance to choose a chest. Which one do you choose? Okay, but the new task, instead of choosing a chest uh, to open with your one chance to get a time. Uh, coin, you can choose a chest to throw away and then you will get all of the coins in the remaining chests. Okay, so what does minimal, do minimal representations of possibility predict? Well, if you're simulating a coin went in, that went into this, this chest, you don't throw that one away. If you simulate a coin that went into one of these, you throw away the other chest. So, so if you're doing minimal representations of possibility, you should always throw away one of the coins on this chest. That's also what you should do if you have modal representations of possibility, but that's what you should do if you, if you have minimal ones. So we take the three-year-olds who are choosing 50-50 um, in the three cups task and give them this throwaway task after show, lots of training showing they understand the task. Okay, um, and here's the findings. Um, these are three-year-olds. Here's the distribution of uh, throwing away the chest on the un uncertain side. The modal response um, of t uh, is um, eight out of eight trials choosing throwing away a chest on the other side. And one child um, explained who did it eight out of times, explained it. He says, well, there's a coin here there's a coin here, so this one's empty, so I'm throwing this one away, right? So he, he laid out the, the, his reasoning, showing you that he was doing one simulation and treating it as reality. But 
Look, that's also the response you would get if you, you understood, if you had modal concepts. That's what adults would do too, is throw away from that side. So, so maybe this task somehow just brought out the modal concepts they have. Um, so, um, a final experiment to rule that possibility replicates the throwing away result and then asks at the end, so you've thrown away one and what you have there is an X on the screen where that one was so the child can remember which, which was from the doubleton side and which was from the singleton side, okay? And the question at the end is, which chest do you want to open? Okay, so if, if you had modal representations and that's why you were, you were throwing away from the doubleton side, you should pick this one because this is 100% certainty and this is only 50% certainty. And here's what's happened. A replication of throwing away from the other certain, picking between the two, absolutely 50-50. Okay, so we take this as really strong evidence that minimal representation of possibility are underlying the performance on um, the uh, two cups task and the three cups task and the four cups task as, as well. Okay, I'm not going to tell you about modal language, so I'm going to skip that, but we can use these experiment, the same setup to, to, to test modal language. And what we find is that children don't dis distinguish can and have to until age five or six. Um, and they're beginning to uh, uh, map modal concepts onto language at age four. So sorry that I don't have time to do that because I want to turn to one last result. So what I've argued in the preschool period is there strong evidence for option B here. There's a constrained search with the representation of the goal and the elimination of the option shown to be empty, but no deductive certainty, no premise involving or no representations of the modal concepts, possibility, necessity until beginning at age four, okay? But now let's go back to infancy. Is, is this the right interpretation of the infant deductive in, uh, uh, syllogism experiments or is um, this one possibly right? That there's a constrained search with the representation of goal alone and a match computation alone, right? So there's, you, you keep just, you search at random, you keep searching until the threshold for a match is achieved. If this doesn't preclude, the signature of this is it doesn't preclude searching in the same location again, right? So last experiment, the infant studies. So what happens in the, as I told you, we don't even know when infants solve the call cup task. Um, so here is the, what I showed you before, with what a 15 month old did. Oh, are you ready? Hey, Looper, it's going. Okay, now look at this. And look at this. All right, where's the ball? Can you find the ball? Where's the ball? Okay. There it is. Okay. 15 months, half the time, go first to the option just shown to be empty. Okay. It's not a recency or a primacy effect. It doesn't matter which one, which bucket was manipulated first. But this is a striking failure to eliminate an option on the basis of seeing that something is empty. Now, they then do do the other one, right? They keep searching for the ball. Um, but 17-month-olds, um, on, the, on, on the contrary, do eliminate the option. Now, again, we ruled out with the control experiment that the 15-month-olds were motivated to get the ball. Um, uh, they, could, they weren't confused. They didn't just wipe out their working memory of, of uh, what the situation was by the complicated 
showing one is empty and raising up and down with the following control experiment in which the only difference is she separates her hands before she lowers the ball. Watch this. Okay, so now they can see where it's going, but they have to remember all of that and okay, hold it through. And look at this. Okay, so now they can see where it's going. Where's the dog? Can you find the dog? You can find it again. Okay, so they can they pass that control experiment. Okay. So the, so the conclusions from what I've just shown you is that in attempts to try to find evidence for deductive certainty, for propositions joined by or, or for representations of possible and necessary, um, um, you don't find evidence for that until after age three. And you also, there's also a failure to find evidence for option elimination based on not until 17 or to 20 months of age, okay? Okay, so how do we make sense of these conflicting results? There's three resolutions to these, to this, to these conflicts. And I believe all three of them are open, right? Um, um, the successes in infancy and in non-human animals do reflect logical reasoning dependent on logically structured thought. The failures are due to performance demands of the tasks on which infants fail and developmental changes reflect increases in domain general information processing power um, that decrease the performance demands of the tasks. Okay, that's open. But these experiments have internal controls um, for the most obvious of those options. And furthermore, um, the representations of visual in visual working memory are, are completely continuous um, in infancy, starting around 10 months of age and adulthood, with limits um, which allow the children to update mental models um, and represent two sets of two sets of two ob uh, objects hidden across several multiple containers. You, if you want to, to say, well, look, what are the information processing demands on this? that this task offer. I mean, this is what we were trying to test with the slides experiments. You need to come up with them and test them. But I completely agree, this is an option, an open possibility, okay? The second is the failures sup uh, uh, support the leaner interpretations of the infant successes, interpretations with no symbolic representations of not or impossible. I think that that's open. Um, we, 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 we need to do a lot more work in the infancy looking for signatures of the actual representations that are underlying the success. And the third is that the infant and animal successes reflect precursors to or protological versions of the logical operators or not or possible, okay? Now, I think this is possible too. Right, um, that they're, they're implicit representations, but there you need to actually say what those might look like and seek evidence for them. And um, what a precursor to would be a a precursor might be a representation that has some of the logical functions of the logical operator you're looking for, uh, like a minimal representation of possibility, but not all of them. So it's minimal in the sense that it isn't a full, uh, it doesn't implement the full uh, conceptual role of the function you're looking for, um, but it's possibility because it implements some of them. Um, and B Bermudas et al. Um, think that the infant, the the animal literature uses the uh, contrary aspect of negation, contrariety, but not full logical negation. So again, I think uh, po th these possibilities can be spelled out and tested. That's that's what we were. That's what I was trying to illustrate with the, the 
proposal for minimal representations of possibility and then looking for evidence that that's actually what the children are doing. Um, um, but um, again, um, one needs to spell them out and try to look for signatures that adjudicate between them. So the plea here is not that I know which of those three resolutions is right. Um, the final plea is um, we need to take the successes and the failures equally seriously. And we need to try to find, you know, make precise proposals for what kind of mental models and computations over them are underlying the successes um, um, or the non-adult behaviors that we're seeing um, um, to um, adjudicate between those three uh, possibilities. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Susan. I forgot to mention that Susan is giving her talk at 7 a.m. So really thank you for the heroic <laughs> effort. Um, we're a bit over time, so I think we can switch straight to our second speaker and try to save some time for questions at the end. So if you have a question, please note it down. We'll either get to it at the end or we'll go to it in Slack. Um, for the moment, Susan, if you could stop the screen share. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Let me just help. You should be looking for in the center at the top or the bottom, it should be something that says stop share a little green. There it goes, I got it. And so now I'll introduce our next speaker, jean Remy Oakman, who is a CNRS researcher based at the Institut de Sciences Cognitives in Lyon, France. Welcome jean Remy. Hi everyone, just one second, I launch. Okay, do you see my slides? Yes, it looks great. Excellent. Okay, so, um, well, thank you, first of all, to, uh, I want to thank our organizers, uh, Rachel especially, and Isabel. Uh, I'm really sorry that we cannot be in, uh, in Dubrovnik, it's such a beautiful city, Croatia is such a beautiful country, so I hope We'll have another opportunity someday. Um, so, okay, let me directly uh, dive in. So what we are trying to do ultimately, I think is to uh, answer three questions. First, we want to characterize what kind of uh, mental representation, what the thought can be before language has developed, so in young infants. Second, we want to characterize what kind of uh, uh, thought uh, human adults have once they have language. And of course, we want to characterize the mechanism that can explain any change that could be between these two types of, uh, of representations. Um, and, and, and this last question is really, uh, is really the third question, because of course, uh, we cannot answer this question before we have identified the problem that we need to, to solve. So if we realize that there's no fundamental difference between say infant cognition and adult cognition, then what we have is really just a, a, a mapping problem. But if we realize that there are fundamental uh, differences and I believe uh, there are, and, and from what we heard uh, from Susan uh, just now, uh, we, you should believe also that they are, uh, then we will have to explain uh, something like a conceptual change or maybe a representational uh, change. So <clears throat> what can, uh, so what do we know very, very briefly about uh, the format of mental representations in, uh, in young infants? Uh, so for sure, uh, we can argue that infants have something that we might want to call um, mental imagery. So they have uh, perceptual or perceptual-like representations and they can keep in memory. And uh, that can account for things like habituation, uh, object recognition, but also perceptual categorization and some mental computations such as mental rotation. Uh, human infants also uh, have uh, core cognition and core cognition uh, has been argued by, by Susan and other people to have also a, a format that is close 
uh, that is perceptual like uh, in the sense that it is supposed to be analog or iconic, uh, though it also involves contents that are not perceptual. So the idea is that here, or at least that's the way I understand it, that young infants uh, still use here some perceptual like uh, representations, but uh, they have principles about the, the behavior that this kind of uh, entities uh, might have uh, in the world and they know that objects, uh, intentional agents have different types of, uh, of behaviors. So <clears throat> what I want to, to point out here and, and, and here, in fact, I'm following on, on uh, Premac in uh, 1983 is that perceptual like format of representation is well suited to represent entities but much less so to represent abstract relations and maybe abstract concepts in, in general. And, and this follows from the definition of abstractness uh, itself, that is, that, the, that is the quality of being considered apart from a specific instance uh, or object. So, and if, you, if you're not convinced, try to think how you would uh, draw uh, an abstract concept such as, uh, I don't know, freedom or an abstract relations. And, uh, and this is something uh, very difficult, if not impossible. So of course, you know, things like conceptual art uh, try to do this, but conceptual art cannot be uh, understood by itself, right? It has, it's not directly interpretable. It has to be interpreted. It has to be, so you have to make an inference so it has to be explained to you. So there's no direct interpretation um, of, uh, of, of this. So, so all this to say that uh, perceptual like uh, format of representation make it very hard to represent an abstract relation. But if you have propositional uh, representations uh, uh, where, which is defined um, by the idea that um, uh, relations are represented by abstract a model discrete symbol. So the idea is that here you do have uh, a, a discrete symbol that represents the relation. So you would represent something like A, R, B, meaning the relation between A and B. And those symbols combine just like words combine or phrases combine to, to make a sentence in, a, in language. So if young infants have that kind of representation, then representing abstract relation maybe is not such a hard problem anymore because they might have that kind of a discrete symbol to represent the relations. So. <clears throat> um, all this to, to introduce the idea that uh, looking at abstract relations, and I'm going to focus now on uh, the relations same and different, uh, is a case study to investigate the format of infant uh, thought. And uh, I, I want to take this opportunity to advertise uh, um, a special issue that we just published earlier this year uh, in Current Opinion of Behavioral Science. Uh, that we co-edited with Ed Wasserman and, and Susan Carey, that presents a lot of different views about same uh, and different. And so you might find more information uh, than what I'm going to discuss in this talk. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so indeed, uh, so, so if you look at the uh, literature on animal cognition, uh, they, there's a huge literature uh, that relates to the concept same and different. And uh, from a first view of that literature, it seems that all species that have been looked at, from bees to pigeons, uh, to monkeys, chimps, uh, to ducklings, uh, have a representation of uh, same and different. But behind this apparent homogeneity, there's in fact a lot of variability in the type of paradigms that's been used. And uh, so for instance, uh, the B study that, uh, that was conducted by Geoffa uh, and published in Science used a match to sample and non match to sample paradigm. And this kind of, a, of paradigm, in fact, has been used with many species and most species seem to succeed. There's a, another type of, a, of a paradigm that seems to be easily graspable by many, many uh, animal species. But what I want to stress here is that there is one particular paradigm, the relational match to sample paradigm, that on the contrary seems to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for non-human species. So it seems like that here, with respect to uh, the relation same and different, there is a discontinuity. So it might not be a, a, a discontinuity in the sense that you go from no representation of same and different to a full concept of same and different, but there is a change. There is something that uh, might change in those representation in the course of evolution. So <clears throat> in, in, uh, in this talk, I will try to make three points. First, I want to convince you 
that there is also a discontinuity along ontogeny with respect to the ability to represent abstract relations. Uh, second, I will ask whether young infants also have uh, abstract relations, and uh, finally uh, discuss the, the format of these representations. So <clears throat> let's focus on the relational match to sample. So the relational match to sample is a task where you present uh, pairs of stimuli. So for instance, the two letters A and A here, and the participant has to select another pair of stimuli. Okay. So the idea is that, and what, what matters is the relation within the pairs. So if the two letters are the same, A and A here, you have to select C and C because they're also the same. If the two letters are different, A and B, you have to select D and E because D and E, just like A and B, are different. Okay. So uh, in, uh, in, in his 83 uh, paper, um, David Premack was, uh, so this is the, the quote from, from the paper, was basically saying that young children have a lot of difficulty in this task, uh, that uh, for young, children younger than four fail and only by six, uh, they appear to, to succeed. And he was citing uh, this paper, Premack and Macler in preparation. And uh, we searched the literature, we never found that paper. Apparently it remained in preparation as of today. But uh, what surprised us is that apparently since the 80s, no one had actually uh, run uh, this experiment with young children. So this is what we uh, decided to do uh, was 10 years ago uh, now. So the, the first version of the task was done this way. We introduced two puppets here, Doggy and Panda, and uh, those puppets like certain type of cards. So if I show uh, this card here, and I tell the kids that uh, doggy like this card, and I'm going to the, present two other cards and ask which of these two cards do you think doggy will also like. Okay. And so, of course, there's a rule here, which is that if doggy likes a card where the symbols are different, he will also like another card where the symbols are different. And if panda likes a card where the symbols are the same, he will like other cards where the symbols are the same. Okay, so, so to solve the task, the, the children have to, uh, to use the relation between the symbols on the cards. And <clears throat> um, so here we, we tested children from three to six years of age. And you can see that we replicate uh, the, the pattern that was quoted by, by uh, Primac. That is that uh, six-year-olds succeed uh, reliably, five-year-olds succeed also as a group, but three and four-year-olds here were a chance. And they were chance on both uh, matching same to same and matching different to different. And um, from the animal literature, what we know is that this is also what uh, animals do, particularly monkeys and, and pigeons. So three-year-olds and four-year-olds here appear to behave just like the monkeys and pigeon that is fading in the relation match to sample. Um, <clears throat> next, we uh, uh, simplified somehow the, the task. So now, it's the same idea, but now we're directly showing cards, okay? And we're asking children which of these two cards thing goes with this card, okay? So if I show these two cards, where the, this one card, sorry, where the symbols are different, the children have to select that card where the symbols are different. If I show a card where the symbols are the same, they have to select another card where the symbols are the same. And here we replicate again the finding that is that five-year-olds fail and four-year-olds succeed. Um, now, in the animal literature, again, uh, uh, the work of Ed Wasserman and, uh, and his colleagues have shown that with pigeons and baboons, if instead of using pairs of stimuli, you use areas of six, 16 stimuli like this, where the stimuli are all the same or all different, then the animals succeed. So we asked again whether we would find the same pattern with children. And again, we find the same pattern. That is now three years and four years do succeed with 16 uh, item arrays, whereas they were failing with two item arrays, okay? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now, again, in the Wasserman studies, um, after training the animals with arrays that were all the same or all different, they also uh, included mixed cards where not all the not, not all the symbols are the same, not all the symbols are, are different, but you have a mixture, okay? And uh, the task now is to map one of these mixed array with either the old same array or the old different array. 
And what's important here to note is that apart from uh, describing this card as all the same, all different, or four different, 12 different, etc., you can uh, measure the degree of viability within uh, the, the, these cards. And this is what this measure of entropy is doing. Okay, So when all the icons are the same, uh, the entropy is zero. When you have six different items, uh, the, the entropy is four. And when you have uh, a variability of uh, same and different uh, icons, you have uh, intermediary uh, entropy. And so, uh, yeah, so this is what you get with eight different icons and 12 different icons. So <clears throat> this is uh, 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 the data from uh, one of uh, uh, Joel Fago and Ed Wasserman's paper. Uh, on the top, you have two baboon participants and on the bottom, you have two human participants uh, who are tested in this relation match to sample with 16 item arrays and with various uh, uh, entropy, so various mixture of, uh, of same and different uh, uh, icons. And what uh, you should see here is that for the baboons, you have a, a linear or logarithmic relation to entropy. So it's a continuous relation uh, with entropy. So participants select the all different responses in an increasing fashion, uh, uh, depending on the, on the entropy of the, of the sample count. In human adults, you see a different pattern, which is much more cate categorical. So as soon as you have some different items, they tend to select the all different icons. We suggest that they categorize uh, the cards as all the same versus not all the same. So <clears throat> we uh, also run uh, this experiment uh, with uh, uh, adult participants, and th this was done online on Mechanical Turk. And those are the patterns that, that we get. So here we tested almost 100 participants, and you can see that we observe only two types of patterns, either the all same versus not all the same pattern, okay, that is participants select the all same card for all same sample, and as soon as you have different uh, cards, different icons in the mix, they select the all different. So they seem to do a classification as all the same versus not all the same. But the most common pattern was something that we interpret as uh, uh, being a rule that is all the same versus all different. And that makes a lot of sense. Remember, this is what participants are trained on, right? So they train to uh, match all the same with all the same, all different with all different. And what they do basically with the intermediary arrays is to uh, match it with the most similar. So if you have only four different, they match it to all the same and beyond that, they go to all different. Okay, so those are adults. Uh, now we want to compare this to what children are doing. So the question is really what children are doing here. And uh, this, this is uh, what we got with three and four year olds. Uh, so uh, what you can see, look first on, on the right is that, um, most children, in fact, all, almost all of the three-year-olds do respond in a continuous fashion with varying entropy. So they seem to be uh, behaving as if they were using entropy, just like the, the pigeons and, and the baboons. And by four years of age, we see a mixture of, uh, of behavior. So half of the four-year-olds still seem to be following entropy, but we see also uh, another half of participants that seem to be applying uh, a categorical behavior that suggests that they're representing something like all the same, not all the same, or all the same, all different. Okay, so this is happening. So, so that suggests that around four years of age, there might be something that is changing and children become able to uh, um, represent all the same and uh, all different. And <clears throat> What's happening uh, around that age? Well, in fact, an interesting observation is that this is the age where children uh, have learned the word same and different. So here we, we just tested very simply whether children were understanding the word same and different. And you can see that two-year-olds don't, none of them almost. Four-year-olds all do understand the word same and different. And uh, of course, as you would expect, three-year-olds are in the middle. So some understand the two words, some don't. So that suggests that maybe the acquisition of the word same and different is related to the change in the, in the behavior that, uh, that we saw. And another piece of evidence that supports this idea is that you don't need to understand the details of this, but this, these are the different experiments that, that we've run. And we just separated participants for each experiment between those who are in the frame here that, and, that uh, used spontaneously the word same and different when they uh, were supposed to explain 
uh, what they had done. And you can see that those participants are almost at ceiling in all of our tasks. Whereas those who don't use the word semen different, they're on the other side, they are chance in all of the tasks except one, and that's the task where they could use entropy. Okay, so that suggests uh, that um, that suggests that really uh, using the word same and different is uh, what you need to uh, to pass these tasks. Uh, at least that that's an, um, a suggestion. At this point. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what we have here is a discontinuity along ontogeny. Okay, so around four years of age, we see three uh, changes. First, children have learned. Uh, they have acquired the world semen different. Now they begin to succeed in the relation match to sample, and they seem to be capable of representing something like all the same. So of course, um, now when we talk about discontinuity, the, the question that pops into mind is always that of, uh, of Jerry Furder. That is, okay, how do you learn the world semen different if you don't have a representation, a pre-existing representation of, of same and, and different? And, and this, this question reminds me of, of the chemist uh, Lavoisier, uh, who's famous for uh, noting, uh, arguing that there's no creation, there's only transformation, right? So what I will try to argue is that again, here there's no creation of the concept same and different ex nihilo, but rather there's a transformation of a pre-existing representation. And now the question is what are uh, those representations? But first, let me show you that there are indeed representations of same and different in young infants. And for this, I will use uh, a paradigm that is akin to the same different discrimination task uh, that's been used in the animal literature. So in those tasks, uh, what you do is that uh, you teach participants to respond one way for pairs of same stimuli and a different way for pairs of different stimuli. Okay. And so in this case, we are going to teach infants to look right or left for the infants if they see a, a pair of same stimuli to look the other side if they see pairs of different stimuli. So this is how we are uh, going to do this. <clears throat> Sorry. So, um, so infants here are placed in front of, a, of an eye tracker and uh, in the center, there is something blinking to attract their attention, okay? And here we are going to, uh, so two geometrical figures are going to appear. And so, uh, and after these geometrical figures appear, one puppet is going to appear either on the left window here or on the right window here. So initially infants should have no idea where this puppet is going to appear, but slowly during the experiment, they might discover that there is a rule. And the rule is that if the two geometrical figures are the same, then the puppet is going to appear on the left side. If the two geometrical figures are different, then the puppet is going to appear on the right side, okay. So we repeat this a number of times and we vary the, the shapes and the colors of the, of the figures, but the rule is always the same. Same predicts left, different predicts right. And now in the test, we want to test for generalization and we want to see whether infants are going to search on the correct side. So we're going to show novel pairs of figures with novel shapes, novel colors, and now there's no puppet appearing either left or right. And the question is whether infants are going to search on the correct side or on the wrong side, right? We can measure looking time there. We can measure also the first fixation and uh, both type of measure gives the same result. That is that uh, infant seven months old here could search correctly um, for uh, novel same pairs, but there were a chance for different, okay? So they could learn that same predicts left, but there were a chance for different. Uh, with 12 months old, we did a slightly more complicated experiment, uh, but the, the logic is mainly the same. The only difference is that here, the color is always changing. So only shape matters, okay? So same shape predicts left, different shapes predict right. And again, we test for generalization. And again, we obtain a success for the rule predicated on same. So infants could learn that same shape predicts left, but there were a chance for different. We were also interested in, in seeing whether we can generalize that kind of results to other modalities. So if you do the same type of experiments, but now instead of um, geometrical figures, you use syllables. Uh, so now every time infants look at the center, they're going to hear two syllables. It could be da da or fa fa or lulu. And in that case, there's a puppet that will appear, say on the right. And if the two syllables are different, the puppet will appear on the left. 
Yeah. And again, we find the same results. So when we test for generalization with novel syllables, we find success for the rule predicated on same. So same syllables predict right, but they were changed for different. And the rules, uh, I mean, the, the, the pattern holds as well uh, if only the vowel is, is, uh, is repeated. So if only if, it's, if the rule is about same vowels, infants learn. If it's about different vowels, they are chance. OK, so <clears throat> um, at least same seems to be uh, represented. So right, all these experiments, and there are other from other groups, in particular from uh, uh, Walker and Gopnik, suggesting uh, that uh, young infants have a representation of, of same. But now you might ask, what about different? Uh, and what I I've argued is that most results, uh, if not all of them in the infant literature can be explained by rules only about same. And the reason is that uh, uh, every time you're trying to teach something uh, to infants about different, well, you have to contrast different with something. And what you can contrast different with is same. Okay, so if uh, in a match to sample, I want to teach, inf uh, not match to sample, sorry. I want to teach infants to choose the figure that is different I will have to contrast it with a figure that is the same. And therefore, infants might be learning not to choose different, but to avoid same. And same thing here, if I choose participants uh, like Walker and Gopnik have done to uh, select the pair of tokens that are different, they might be learning just to not select to avoid the pair of icons that are the same. So, <clears throat> um, so the problem here also is that as we've just uh, shown in our experiment, same is more salient or maybe easier to represent than different, right? That's why uh, when infants uh, are, have to learn two rules, same predicts left, different predicts right, they learn only one because maybe learning two rules is difficult, but the one they learn is systematically the one about same. So uh, similarly, when they could learn to choose different or to avoid same, the, the rule that is predicated on same might uh, again be more salient. And uh, in fact, even in childhood and in adulthood, uh, we've seen spontaneous categorization of our arrays as all the same versus not all the same, right? If you remember about 30% of the adults were doing this, but none of them spontaneously categorize as all different versus not all different. Right? So same is really um, more of a primitive uh, than different. Okay, so <clears throat> we, However, we did one experiment that I think suggests that infants have a representation of, of difference. So let me show you how we, we did that. So for this, we, we use a notball paradigm that relies on, on pupillometry. So basically uh, what infants see is this little guy on the screen. And every time they see this guy, they're going to, to hear a sequence of, a, of syllable. So the guy is here only so that infants look at the screen. Um, and so, most of the time, the sequences will have a common structure, which is a sequence of same syllables ending with a different syllable. Okay, so they could hear. So the number of syllables vary, but uh, the structure is always that the last syllable is different. So they might hear lo, 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 ra, or mi, 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 fu, or se, se, ga. Okay, and once in a while, so in 25% of trials, we're going to violate that structure by having no different syllables. So they will hear D, 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 D. And the idea is that if infants have learned the common structure here, that is that the last syllable should be different, then they should be surprised here when the, this last syllable is, is not happening, right? And uh, this surprise should translate into pupil dilation. And this is what we observe here. So here we have the variation of the pupil diameter with respect to a baseline taken here. Uh, in time. And what you can see is an increase of pupil dilation for deviant trials for the sequences of four same syllable compared to sequences that respect the rule that is that end with a different syllable. And we, uh, by the way, replicated this, uh, this result. Okay, so that suggests at least that, that infants are able to compute at least in some way uh, the, the relation of, of difference. We haven't shown uh, in contrast to what we've shown with same, we haven't shown that they can use that representation of different uh, as the input to, to a rule or, or, or to a behavior, right? We've only shown that they are able to, to compute that, that, uh, that relation in, in, the, in some ways. Okay, so <clears throat> 
Now, let me uh, get to, to the last part of the, of the talk, which is the one I'm, I'm most uh, willing to, to, to discuss today. That is the format uh, of, this, uh, of this representation. Okay, so um, in fact, we, we are facing at this point a, a paradox, right? So if you, if you have followed me, uh, you should be convinced that young infants, even six months old, have a representation of sign, right? So they have a representation that allows them to see what's common in the AA pair, in the BB pair, in the CC pair, et cetera, right? And that's what it is to represent same. And that's what should allow them to succeed in, in the, to learn the rules same predicts right. But, uh, and that's where the paradox is, uh, this representation seems to be insufficient to explicitly make the match between uh, two pairs of same uh, items, right? So infants, apparently see that there is something common to BB and to CC, but they seem unable to explicitly match BB and CC. So how can we uh, solve this, this paradox? And this is what I, I will try to do uh, in, the, in the remainder of this talk. And the, the, the hypothesis uh, I want to, to propose comes from um, initially from the experiment uh, that from a match to sample experiment that, that we've run with, with Susan. Um, so uh, th th this was the experiment. So it, it's really a match to sample. So the idea here is that you have cards that appear on the screen. Okay. And, uh, and that, so you have three cards and the, each of them has a symbol on it. And at the end, one of the cards on the side, so either the left one or the right one is going to be animated. Uh, and again, there's a rule. Uh, and in fact, the middle card, which is the last one to flip, the middle card tells you which of the two cards is going to be animated. And it tells it to you because it's the card that is the same that is going to be animated, okay? So here you have a plus sign, here you have a plus sign, here you have a, a, a circle. And so it's the left card that is going to be animated because it's the same as the middle card, okay? So as usual, uh, we, we, we vary here the, the, the symbols, okay? So it's never the same one. It's never on the left, or well, it's sometimes on the left, sometimes on the, on the right. Uh, so uh, the idea here is that what infants have to learn is that it's the symbol. So um, it's whatever the sample card is, they have to choose the one that is the same, okay? So, if the sample card is A, they have to choose A. If the sample card is B, they have to choose B. If the sample card is C, they have to choose C, etc. And one way to uh, conceptualize this, uh, one way to, to, to think that infants might be representing this is by uh, using uh, the notion of a variable. So the idea is that what infants might be represented in the match to sample is a rule uh, that is something like this for X, which is a variable in the domain of interest. So here, um, geometrical figures, choose X, okay? So X is a variable and it's defined by the sample in every trial. Um, so if <clears throat> you accept uh, that, this, that this is something that infants might be able to represent, and then uh, the interesting thing is that from this variable, we can build the construction, uh, so we can build a representation of same. So if X is a variable, then X, X becomes a representation of two same elements. And what I think is interesting is that this representation could maybe solve our paradox. So the key thing to observe is that, okay, X is a variable, so the value of X can change over time, but X can be assigned only one value at a time. And so because it can change over time, that means it can refer to A in the first trial, it can refer to B in the second trial, to C in the third trial and so on. And that way, XX can refer to AA in the first trial, to BB in the second, etc. And that can explain why you can condition a response to XX. So that could explain the success in conditional same different task, right? So like, like the, the task where same predicts right. But because X can be assigned only one value at a time, it cannot refer at the same time to A and B. Okay, so now when you want to match explicitly AA and BB, you cannot use XX anymore because XX cannot refer to AA and BB at the same time. And that could potentially explain the failure on the relation match to sample. Um, <clears throat> I think 
uh, this format of representation can also uh, account for uh, the relative simplicity of same with respect to different. And the idea here is that, okay, so if XX is a representation of same, you might think, well, okay, so a representation of different could be XY, but XY, I would argue, is not a representation of different because Put, put that way, there's nothing that uh, preclude X and Y to take the same value, right? Uh, so what X, Y is, if X and Y are two uh, variable from the same domain, is simply a representation of two, but it's not a representation of different. What you would need in this format to represent different is something more, it's some kind of operation on the second instance of, uh, of X, uh, some kind of negation or or, or exclusion operator that is going to prevent the second instance of the variable to take the same value uh, as, uh, as the first one, okay? So, so in any case, wh uh, whatever the way you, you want to, to, to describe this, different here is more complex than same in that, uh, in that format of representation. Okay, so what I, want, what I argue is that XX can account for uh, uh, the data that we have so far, that is success in the conditional same different tasks, failure in the relation match with sample, and also the idea that different is more complex uh, than same. But now does it also allow us to make a testable prediction? And uh, here the observation is that uh, in XX, what you have is really a sim one symbol per entity, okay? Uh, each of the, repetition of X is a symbol for one of the entities involved in the relation. And that means that because working memory is limited, infants, if they have that type of, uh, if that's the type of representation that they have, should be limited in the number of same elements that they can represent, right? So the prediction is that they should be able to represent two same, we've shown that already, they should be able to represent three same, maybe four same, but at some point that should phase and maybe at five or six, they, they should not be able uh, anymore. So this is <clears throat> what uh, we, we're going to, to test in the, in the final uh, series of experiments. And, and I want to, to point out that that's really a prediction of this type of, uh, of, uh, of representation. So there are other type of representation that relates to, to the idea of same and different that you can consider. None of them uh, make uh, uh, such, uh, such prediction. Okay, so uh, for this uh, 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 study, we also use uh, the odd ball paradigm with a uh, measure of, uh, of pupil dilation. So again, infants uh, see this little guy that is jumping like this, okay? And every time they see him, they hear sequences of syllables. Um, so in the, in the first experiment, uh, this is what we're going to do. So in 75% uh, of the trials, infants are going to hear four syllables that are the same. So the syllable again vary from one trial to another, okay? So they will hear ba, 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 then d, 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 then co, 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 et cetera. And in 25% of the trials, we violate the structure by having a last different syllable. So for instance, lu, 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 me. Okay. And the idea is that if infants have learned that all syllable, the four syllables should be the same, then they should be surprised when there is a final different syllable. And again, we expect to uh, register this surprise by pupil dilation. But now there's another reason why we could uh, detect pupil dilation, which, which is that there could be a reaction just to the local change of syllable, right? So maybe just hearing something like lume or lu, lu, lume itself could trigger pupil dilation, right? So this pupil dilation might not be related to really representing the, the structure of our same syllable. So this is why we uh, have a second group, a control group, where now there are 50% of trials that respect the AAA rules and 50% of trials that uh, respect the AAAB rule. And the idea is that uh, the, the local change, so the, the effect of this local change should be the same by definition in both groups, okay? So if we only have a main effect of trial type uh, that is more pupil dilation for different sequences than for same sequences, then that's no evidence for the representation of the, of the same uh, structure. But what would be evidence for the representation of the structure is an interaction between the group and uh, the, the trial type. Okay, so this is what we uh, uh, did. So 
on the first line, I'm going to, to show always the, the control group first. So in the first, so with four syllables, uh, when you, so we have A, 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 A and A, 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 B uh, sequences, you can see there's no uh, significant uh, effect on pupil dilation. But now if the A, 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 A sequences are more frequent, then we do see uh, pupil dilation and we observe significant interaction. This is what I'm showing here between the, the two groups. So that shows that infants are able to represent the relation between four same syllables. Okay, now what's happening with five? So again, uh, no local effect of the AB uh, transition, but also no effect here in the, uh, in the experimental group where you have more five same uh, sequences than four same one different. And again, uh, there's no effect here with six, we see again no interaction. What we see here is a main effect. Uh, that is that it seems that the sequences A, 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 B by themselves elicit pupil dilation, but there's absolutely no interaction uh, between the, the two groups. And finally, you might ask, well, the, the, so they don't represent six same, but could they represent the first, first element are being the same? And the answer is yes. So when we change the fourth element instead of the final one, we do observe again pupil dilation. So that suggests that infants are able to represent four same elements, but not five same or six same. Um, and uh, now a final uh, point is that, in fact, uh, we never expected them to represent five same or six same because at that age, uh, infants are not supposed to have exact representation of five or six, right? So what they should be able to represent at that point is something like all the same. So this is the final thing that we tested. Again, we replicate here that there's no local effect with four syllables. Uh, and in this experiment, we vary the, the, the number of syllables. So they can be either three syllables, four syllables, or five syllables that are always the same. And then again, the deviant is three same and one different. So if infants are able to represent all the same, they should be surprised when uh, they, they, they hear this. And again, we don't see any evidence for that. So again, that suggests that infants are not representing uh, all the same. So <clears throat> what I take from uh, this, this series of experiments is that the way infants represent same is by representing only individual entities, right? So there's no discrete symbol for same here. What they, the way they build the relation same is by uh, just putting next to each other representation of the individual entities by repeating uh, this abstract variable. Um, so let me wrap up. Um, so <clears throat> with respect to the, at least to, you know, I, I looked here only, of course, at one case study, right? The, the relation same mainly. So I cannot um, say more than, than that, but at least with respect to that representation and to, to that case study, we really don't see much difference between, uh, and, and sorry, and with the, the limitation that we haven't run uh, direct comparative studies between infants and, and, uh, and animals, but we don't see anything that infants do in this task that differentiate them for what other species and particularly um, close species would, uh, would do. And so the idea, uh, what, what I propose is that the way infants represent same is something like this. X, X, okay, so uh, those are abstract representations because they can generalize, they can apply to different pairs. Uh, they can apply to duck, duck, then to cup, cup, etc. Uh, but those are not propositional representation because there is no discrete symbol for same here, right? So the way the relation same is represented is by putting next to each other symbols for the individuals. And note that the, the reason why this representation is abstract is because the representation for the individual, for the entity is abstract, right? It's X that is abstract. And so the abstraction uh, come from uh, the representation of the entity. And now the idea is that later on, children have acquired an abstract symbol, a discrete symbol, sorry, that refer to, to the relation uh, same, that symbol uh, S. Um, and, um, and once they've, they have this, first of all, that, that symbol provides full abstraction because S is now uh, really dissociated from the representation of the entities that 
that it puts in relation, right? So, so the representation of relation is not completely dissociated from the entity. So that's uh, say full abstraction. And also once you have this symbol, maybe it becomes easier to manipulate and easier to combine with other operators such as negation or, or quantifiers. And so far in, in, in our studies, we have no evidence that any of this is happening between four years of age once children have acquired the word same and different. And so that leads to what remains at this point a, a hypothesis, which is that this symbol might be nothing else than the word same, right? So uh, it might be that the acquisition really of the word form same for that, that is linked to this precursor representation of the relation that uh, allows you to uh, make the, 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 the change uh, between these two types of representations. So again, um, what I want to, the hypothesis I want to put on the table is that it might be not much uh, in uh, now generalizing, uh, there might be not much in the infant cognition that differentiate them from uh, other animal uh, species. But what might differentiate human infants is the capacity to acquire word forms that can serve as discrete symbols for abstract relations and maybe abstract concepts in general, and hence crossing the gap between animal cognition and uh, human unique uh, cognition. Thank you. Thank you, jean remy So we have some time for questions on uh, this talk. So if you have a question, uh, make yourself known in the chat window. We'll take our first question from Marina. Hello, jean remy that was such an interesting talk. Um, thank you very much, I learned a lot. Um, so I have kind of a, yeah, I have a question that relates to the introduction of your talk. So you rate, you know, you say, or maybe I can't actually remember which of your talks, you both talked about Fodor, right? But he raises this challenge, which is how do you acquire a meaning that you don't already have? So what what is your answer to that? Right, so you're saying that the kids acquire this symbol um, same. So what, what what solution is there to that problem? So so here, what well, I mean, so I, I don't want to talk about anything else than same because I you know I want just to in the case of same, yeah. yeah. So in the case of same because that, that's where I, I have data. So I mean, what I would argue is 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 you know is what he's saying in this quote is that uh, uh, what there is is a transformation. So what I, would, what I would argue is this is transformation of the representation. So infants have something that, um, that implements uh, the relation same, but they don't have a discrete symbol for it. And it's only once they have the word that they have such discrete symbol that makes it much easier to manipulate and uh, that they can do additional computation with it. So I guess my question then is one way to interpret what you're saying is that they're not acquiring much at all, right? That they're kind of, they're getting this mental tool. Um, you're putting a label on it and the label is enabling them to do all these tasks, but actually they have the concept and then they get the label and, and that like, is yeah. there some transformation, like deep so, transformation so, in the in the concept or not? So you're right. So what, what I would argue for same, in fact, I, I wouldn't talk about a conceptual change in, in this case. I would talk about a representational change. So th that is the idea, indeed, that, that there's no necessarily content, there's no change in the content, but only change in the representation that makes it uh, um, uh, more manipulable. Thank you. But maybe Susan has something to say about this in other cases. We don't hear you, Susan. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So I, I think it is a profound change, a change in format of the sort. Right? A, a representation of the form XX is extremely limited in the way that, that Jean Remy made clear, right? So, so creating a arbitrary unitary symbol that can, that can connect to the rest of language is a, is a profound, a profound um, uh, 
it can combine with quantifiers like all, right? Um, is a profound transformation, but it's, but it's not a different kind of content. The other kind of actual conceptual changes actually occur as well. They occur in history of science and in conceptual development all of the time. But I agree with Jean Remy, that's not an this is not an example of that. Okay, I'm gonna go a bit out of order. We'll take the next question from Wade. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so you were representing sameness as a set, a two membered set, the members of which are the same variable. But uh, you seem to, ad seem to admit that, uh, well, prior to the acquisition of say a, a numeric code, children and non-human animals can represent up to around three or four objects, right? And so presumably they'd be able to represent sameness of a, all members of a three membered set or all members of a four membered set as well, right? So in that case, if they can do that, then the representation of a two membered set XX isn't sufficient for what they can do because they can also, also represent sameness of all members of a three membered set. So presumably they'd also need something like you know, a set, a three membered set that said it was XXX for that relation. And then for four, they would need XXXX, right? And so what, what would be their, um, right, what would be their represent, representation of sameness? Is it XX or is it XXX or is it XXXX or do they have all three? So, yeah, so my, my, uh, what I would argue is that what they have is two same, three same and four same. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, and but, but indeed, so far we haven't, we failed to show that they have a representation of same that generalize on this tree. So uh, what I showed you an experiment where we vary the, the number of syllables, right? We, we have three, four, five same, and they fail. But right. you, you could say, oh, okay, but they don't have five same, right? So maybe if you do two, three, four, they, they, they will succeed. And uh, we've tried that and, and it doesn't work either. So, so it, it's a non-result and uh, um, I want to replicate it. I mean, I want to, to, to go deeper, but it seems that they don't uh, generalize uh, uh, between two same, three same and four same. So at this point, my, my response would be that they have the three, that they have two same, three same and four same. Okay, yeah, so they don't have a generalized conception of sameness. They have two same, three same and four same. Right. I see, thank you. Okay, we'll go back to the order in the chat window now and take the next question from Gary. Thank you for a, a pair of uh, super provocative talks. Uh, this is a question for both, maybe more for Susan. Um, I very much resonate with the urge to uh, take a lean interpretation of the, the infant data and to really interrogate, you know, do, does this show deductive inference? Susan, I'm wondering if you would also apply that to adults. Um, we, as adults, especially as adult scientists, uh, we, we do find it quite natural, but do you think that there's a shift from kind of defaulting to these more situational um, solutions, more specific solutions to these problems where you don't explicitly represent the possibilities to, as adults, defaulting to the more logical deductive solutions? Or do you think that while adults are capable of it, there is still kind of, it, it's still easier to do what the younger infants are doing? Um, well, no adult would act like the three and four year olds in these experiments, right? I mean, they do not default, you know, if, if I put a thousand dollar bill in a, in a single cup, and a thousand dollar bill between two doubleton cups and give you one chance to choose, I guarantee you no adult would fail, right? Um, so, so um, but I do agree, right? Um, that um, the representations that the babies and the animals have, we still have, and there will be situations that we default to them but, but the, 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 there's a huge work on mental, a, a degree of work um, on natural deduction systems, mental logic, um, where the, 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 
representations when they're formulated linguistically are automatic and easy. It's just not the case that you need to be a scientist before you, you before you use this. And this machinery, the machinery, uh, the full machinery of modal logic and uh, propositional logic and um, quantificational logic is needed for natural language semantics, right? So it's just not the case that it's not everywhere in, in once you have a language of thought. Now that doesn't mean that you don't deploy it systematically and metaconceptually and hypothesis testing and tell you the rest the renaissance, you don't. But, but it's not the case that it isn't a default system of representation within language. Yeah, so I, I, I completely agree and certainly uh, with the thousand dollar bill, but at the same time, when you run adults in relational match to sample tasks, um, under lots of circumstances, at, for example, Ed Wasserman's work nicely shows, for many people, it's not the default. Uh, no, no, that that's just it's true. hard for some people. No, no that's just not true. We, we ran 600 adults in two item relational match to sample and 599 spontaneously succeeded um, from the first trial on, right? Um, so it's true that in the entropy experiments, there's three possible mm -hmm. rules. And, and, and um, all you have to do to get adults to succeed is to, is to tell them, well, and, you know, match all same to all yeah. same, everything that's not all same to not all same. The, but the fact that they don't, decide, they don't default to one of those rules after, but I mean, adults don't ever do entropy. They either do all same to not all same or all same and all different as Jean Remy showed, but we have much more data as well. So really it's true. All of those representations are, pos are possible. You can get adults to, to match on entropy because of course we represent entropy. You can get them to, to quantify over all same and all different. And they spontaneously quantify over all same and all different, but there's two different rules and you get a mixture of those among adults. So it's really just, now here is an interesting observation. And th this is part of the question I would have, something I would have mentioned to you in, res to, in, um, uh, in, in response to your task. I didn't know about your um, um, match to sample experiments in the home signers. Um, but there's also, th there's also failures of un unschooled Samani adults in uh, progressive matrices tasks, but not schooled Samani adults. And there's pilot data of failure on even two item spontaneous success on two item RMTS in, a, in Samani adults, yep. right? So I think, but there's also, as John Remy said, um, represent you know, in the in the child literature, learning the word same um, is playing playing a role in the developmental change that that you're seeing here. I don't think it's just the word, though. I think I think that it relates to Marina's question of what what does that transformation, the representation do for you? I think it's more than just learning the word. It allows you to now integrate that word with negation and, and quantifiers um, easily. This question is from Ballant. Yeah, thank you for both of you for these great talks. Uh, I have a question for uh, Jean Remy. Um, I, and I would stay now with your proposal that is actually the word uh, that makes the trick. And I was wondering what's your position about when a word is learned and is able to do this trick. So there's data that six month olds do something with words and I can identify pictures accordingly. There's the N400 response much later on and then same and different is learned again a lot later. So, and the second half or part of the question is, do you think there's a qualitative difference between more concrete or more abstract words? So, uh, um, I'm not sure I understand everything. So, I mean, uh, when, so on our data, the words same and different seem to be understood 
only uh, between three and four years of age, right? So, uh, and this is done in very simple way. We show two cards, ones where the symbols are the same, one where the symbols are different. And we ask the kids, can you show the card where the symbols are the same, where the symbols are different? And two years really don't get it. Four years are bored, it's too easy. And three years it's half and half. Um, and, and um, but it's possible though that uh, maybe in a more implicit task, we would see earlier understanding. So it could be that uh, there is, you know, some, uh, uh, some trace of uh, already of association between the world and, and, uh, and the relation earlier uh, that I, I, I don't know. That's something uh, I'd like to test, but not done so far. Um, so what, what I think is that once you have the world, I mean, uh, as Susan just said, uh, it, it also one thing that happens once you have the world is that it becomes much more relevant, right? So you, when you do, when children are doing this kind of task, uh, what they have to do is to come up with a rule to give the, the correct answer and satisfy the experimenter. So uh, they, they have to come up with a hypothesis. And of course, if you have a word, you might be much more likely to come up with that hypothesis. So that, that also uh, potentially part of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the solution here. And, and but at the same time, it's not because you have the words that you immediately come with a hypothesis. So in fact, we probably, so what we see is that kids that use the words succeed but we certainly have kids, we certainly have four-year-olds that do know the words, but don't use them uh, in our task and don't uh, think about using them uh, in our task, right? So in, in this, a bit like in, in Gary's talk yesterday, here it seems to be really about using the words online in the task. It's not just having learned. So it's not a situation where you've learned the words that allowed you to build the concept and now you have the concept without uh, needing to use the words. It seems so far in the data that, that, that we have that you, you use the words online. Um, but, you know, that's something to, to look at more closely. Okay, we're cutting into our asynchronous session. So we'll stop things here and we'll uh, try to take our group photo at the start of the first session tomorrow. So join us back here for that. So um, thank you to our speakers from this session. Please check out the asynchronous session and I'll see you all back here in an hour for our second session of the day. 